Hello everyone, my name is Anne Lord and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's AWRI webinar. Today's session will provide a climate look outlook ahead of the fast approaching 2018 vintage. Joining me today is Darren Ray, a senior meteorologist with the Bureau of Meteorology. Darren is part of BOM's agriculture program and his role includes analysing major influences and trends in Australian climate and communicating this to a range of agricultural sectors. For those of you in the audience, I invite you to join in today's conversation. To provide a comment or ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send. If you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to view later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Wine Australia for, for providing funding and support for AWRI webinars. For those of you just joining us today, welcome. The topic for today's webinar is Bureau of Meteorological Seasonal Outlook for Vintage 2018. And I'll hand over now to our speaker, Darren Ray, to start the conversation. Thanks everyone for your time today uh, to uh, join the webinar. Um, so I'm, so I'm uh, just a little, little bit about myself. I joined the Bureau in 2002 and trained as meteorologist. Did five years of short-term forecasting. Uh, but the last 10 years have been doing, uh, been work, working as a senior climatologist, uh, basically looking at the various climate influences and changes and trends and, and uh, seasonal, seasonal forecasting um, with a focus on South Australia where I'm located. Uh, but uh, more recently, I'll just highlight that um, uh, the Bureau has, has um, developed a stronger focus on agriculture with our, our relatively new agricultural program, which has started um, in about in July 2017. So, um, and my role is, is, um, is as, as, part of the, as part of a team around Australia um, that are focusing, focusing much more strongly in agriculture, and that includes, as well as uh, broad, broad acre cropping, um, livestock, and a whole range of other sectors, it is very focused on on wine and grapes. So, um, I guess one of the key things I'd like to point out at the start of this is we, uh, we're very keen to get some conversations going about how we can better join up uh, your needs for information with all the range of products and services that we uh, that we produce, and and much of which you'll be seeing in the next. Um, uh, next 20 30 minutes so what i'm also going to focus on is um so what's been happening in in this year so far uh I'll talk about the climate influences that are around at the moment both in the long term and the medium term so things like uh what's the current situation with la nina and what's what, what that's going to mean for for the summer and um uh so looking at the short to medium term outlook so what, what, what are we expecting through the next um through the through the rest of december and then looking at the seasonal outlook through the remainder of summer and, and what we can say about um, about conditions leading up to and through harvest uh, for 2018. So just, um, just a bit, a little bit of a look at um, spring rainfall. So I've got a map of the spring rainfall deciles on the left there and just highlighting the uh, quite variable um, spring rainfall conditions that we, we've seen across Australia. But in general, across the wine growing regions, um, apart from perhaps Queensland, um, it has been on the a bit on the dry side for spring fairly generally. Um, and basically, we've just seen strong map on the right there is indicating that the reason for that is largely being stronger than average high pressure systems sitting over, over just to the south of Australia in those green areas on the right hand side there. Um, in terms of temperatures, um, it's been some interest, some, some a, a tendency towards warmer than average conditions. And you'll notice on the map on the left there some, some quite strongly warm and average days in those brown areas across um, uh, across the South Australian, Victorian, and New South Wales wine regions, um, with nights tending to be, on the right hand side tending to be a bit warmer than average as well. Now, in terms of those um, those spring spring temperatures, um, 
there was quite strong warming that we saw develop through November. So if we look at, um, for instance, the October no November temperatures on the right hand side there, that region across uh, the southeast and South Australia and across across uh, much much of Victoria and Tasmania um, is showing that sort of very strong heat that we're seeing developing uh, through November. Um, and if we look at the rainfall on a sort of longer term perspective, uh, so the map on the left there is the April to November rainfall, um, just highlighting that um, it was generally a dry spring, but as that came after a, a relatively dry winter winter as well um, across uh, across much of southern Australia. So, in general, conditions have been on the dry side over the longer term. But more recently, uh, we've just had some ver burst of ver very wet conditions in the last uh, week or so, particularly across Victoria so, and southern New South Wales. So really, uh, this is, I guess, the first of the climate influences I'm, I'm going to talk about is the uh, Madden Junior os Oscillation. And um, so this is basically uh, a burst of tropical activity that move along the equator. So you can see in the top diagram there, it's starting off near Africa. Um, over a few week periods moving across northern Australia and as, the, as it moves across northern Australia increases the moisture availability in cloud and that's, that, that's supportive of widespread rainfall events across Australia in that, uh, that phase, um, phase of the, this Madden Julian, Julian or MJ oscillation or MJ activity. And then um, over a couple of week period after that, the rainfall moves away from Australia and in that sort of phase where it's away from Australia, we tend to get suppressed, uh, reduced rainfall um, across Australia. So basically what I'm talking about this is we've had a couple of bursts. The, the MJ was really active from about sort of, typically from about sort of October, November through to about March or April um, has, its, has its major influence on rainfall. So it's really, uh, really an important one to monitor for rainfall activity and rain, uh, significant rainfall events for this time of the year. So we actually saw a bit of a, a quite a strong burst of activity in late October, um, and then another burst that that supported the rainfall we've seen um, in the last week or so. So um, a uh, a pulse of activity that moved across northern Australia in from about sort of late November through to early early December this year, and that contributed to the the widespread rainfall event that we saw. So I've got the map on the right there as an event from a few years ago um, in December two thousand eleven. Um, but if we look at the rainfall that we, uh, we've seen in the last week or so, um, some very large totals there that were supported by that, um, that MJO tropical activity. Now, I guess the key thing with this, um, so are, are we expecting any, anything more in the next, um, next month or so? Well, the, uh, at the moment, the MJO is moving off into the Pacific Ocean. So that tends to, uh, for the next couple of weeks, that's not particularly, that's not supportive at all of, of further widespread rainfall activity. Um, and in terms of our outlooks or forecasts of the MJO activity, um, we can look about two to six weeks ahead. And what we're seeing at the moment is just uh, not much going on through till about probably at least early, uh, sorry, mid-January. Um, and so something we're monitoring quite closely and we, when we do see some stronger, stronger indications of a positive MJO activity that um, can give some, some indications out that sort of, four to six weeks ahead, which is not seeing much going on after this pulse that's just gone through. So that's, um, that's sort of, uh, are we likely to see another follow-up event? Um, at least, not, not for at least another, I, I suggest another four to six weeks. That has contributed to some above average soil moisture levels. So um, I'll just mention this product because um, people may or may not have seen this. It's on our water information page on our website, so I've got the link there. Um, and what we what we're doing is running a each day we're running a three uh, calculations of um, soil moisture levels, runoff, um, evapotranspiration um, on three layers in the atmosphere. Sorry, in the in, in the in the ground, uh, we've got a ten, zero to ten centimeter layer, a ten centimeter one meter layer, and a one meter to six meter layer. We update, the, update this on a daily basis on a five kilometer grid across Australia. So um, you can actually go, go in and look at this tool and get a time series of your location or your catchment um, and look at um, how different things are from average at the moment or compare past years to, to this year. And I, as an example, this recent rainfall has left, as you might expect, above average 
soil moisture levels across much of um, Victoria and southern New South Wales. And we're seeing that across a um, fair bit of South Australia as well, and some parts of the Queensland, Queen, uh, Queensland coastal areas. And if you compare that to this time last year, um, despite the very wet conditions that we saw through spring last year, uh, things were a little bit on the drier side as we got through um, uh, once, once we got through to early December last year compared to this year. So that's a bit of a look at what's been happening. In terms of the conditions over the next uh, few weeks, so out through the remainder of December, I'm just showing some, um, just showing some modelling here of rainfall, so the difference from average, uh, difference from average on the left-hand side there, and the um, difference from average maximum temperatures expected over the next two-week blocks. Uh, so I've got the first half of December on the top row, and the second half of December on the bottom row. And I guess, the, um, I guess the things we're seeing out of that, in the shorter term, the coastal areas in Queensland and New South Wales are seeing, um, seeing, seeing some rainfall, but much of the rest of the country and, and wine regions generally, apart from perhaps WA, are expected to be on the dry side through the next, next two weeks. Um, that doesn't mean there'll be no rainfall, but um, just the likelihood of getting, getting uh, more uh, large, spread, large widespread rainfall across um, across the uh, much of New South Wales and South Australia and Western Victoria is, is looking a bit lower. Temperatures are a little bit on the cool side, so we're certainly seeing that at the moment um, with some very mild temperatures around Southern Australia. And that looks to continue to be the case through the next week or so, um, apart from a bit of a burst of warmer conditions um, for a few days over, over, over the coming weekend. Um, and for the second half of December, Similar sort of story, though, blue area is indicating that um, some, some indications of, of some above, tendency towards above average rainfall across the eastern states, um, the eastern, uh, and the east, eastern half of Victoria and uh, across New South Wales and, and parts of Queensland, uh, but tending to be perhaps a little bit on the dry side across other, other regions of, uh, of the country, so Western Victoria, um, South Australia and, and Across, uh, across into West WA as well. And continuing a little bit on the cool side. So we're not seeing indications of extreme heat um, through the rest of December. In terms of the major climate influences at the moment, um, on a broader scale, uh, people probably have, have picked up that um, where the Bureau has recently de declared a La Nina event has just, has just started up. Um, so I've just got the diagrams here of the differences between El Nino and neutral or average conditions and linear conditions on the right hand, the left hand side there. So 2015, we saw a very strong El Nino event develop in the Pacific Ocean uh, quite early in 2015. And El Ninos tend to see warmer than average temperatures in the oceans uh, in the Central and Eastern Pacific Ocean, as you can see in the diagram there with the red. And they tend to see cooler than average temperatures around Northern Australia, and that reduces the moisture availability and cloud and rainfall, so tending to result in hotter and drier conditions through winter and spring and into early summer in El Nino events. In La Nina events, um, what we see is cool, stronger trade winds and cooler than average ocean temperatures in the central and eastern Pacific, in those blur areas on the diagram on the left, and uh, we tend to see warmer than average temperatures around northern Australia developing in typically in La Nina events. That increases the moisture availability in the cloud we tend to result in, in cooler and wetter conditions in linear events. Now, linear, both El Nino and El Nino events typically develop in uh, around about June, July, August, uh, sometimes September. Um, and this one, this, this event that we've just, just declared on Tuesday is a very late developing event for, for, a, for a La Nina event. Um, now, we do produce regular reports about what's going on with the with, with the La Nina and El Nino climate system. Um, and they, they get updated every two weeks during the progress of an event. So keep an eye on that link as this event develops. Um, in terms of the Southern Oscillation Index, um, so for those who, who see that on landline, um, it's a measure of, measure of the difference from uh, of what's going on with the surface pressure at Tahiti, so out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, um, as we can see that red dot there and, and the difference from average of surface pressure out at Darwin. So 
inland and near events, what we're seeing is the air rising up more than average over Darwin, contributing to rainfall and cloud formation. And so, so over at, at Darwin, the surface pressure tends to be lower than average. And out to Hitty, the atmosphere tends to sink down more and they tend to get higher than average surface pressure. And then if you calculate the, calculate the difference between those, um, we, that results in a positive Southern Oscillation Index value. So positive, persistently positive Southern Oscillation Index values are indicating La Nina conditions. And so we use a um, plus seven threshold for the SOI, minus seven for El Nino. So you can see the persistently negative El Nino, sorry, SOI and the indicating El Nino conditions in 2015. And we've just seen some a move into positive SOI conditions indicating La Nina um, in the last, the last few months. So um, I've got a map here from uh, about two months ago of the, on the right-hand side of the difference from average of sea surface temperatures. And there's not huge amounts going on there, but what we're seeing develop in the last few months is this um, cooling of ocean temperatures, typical of La Nina out the central and East Pacific. That's one feature, that's really one, one of the um, things we've been observing. The other one to keep an eye out for is this very much warmer than average ocean temperatures that are developed out over, this, over southeastern Australia and around New Zealand and Tasmania and along the, uh, the Victorian and South Australian coasts. Um, that's been a very significant change um, in terms of uh, the ocean temperatures in that area and that has, that has following effects in terms of the, uh, the local climate across those, um, those coastal, region, coastal wine regions in Victoria and South, and South Australia and also Tasmania as well obviously. I guess the other thing to note with this is while it's, um, it is in parts of the Western Pacific a bit warmer than average with sea surface temperatures, around Northern Australia, the ocean temperatures, uh, sea surface temperatures are actually still pretty close to average. It's turning a, a little bit warmer than average across the Northwest of, of Australia. Um, but in general, they're actually pretty close to average. So we've gone from, um, sorry, we've gone from alert phase and uh, which we were in a few weeks ago. We've just declared the La Nina event has started. Um, but it, I guess there's a few things to keep in mind. It's very late. Um, it's uh, looking to be a fairly weak one. And it's looking like it'll be, in terms of our modelling, look like it'll move back to neutral um, by about sort of late March or through April. So we're expecting the event to be only around influencing climate um, only fairly moderately through through December, January, February, um, and then the impact starting to disappear through March and certainly gone by April, May. Um, and the I guess those near average ocean temperatures are forecast to look to continue that way through the next through the event, and so that reduces the impact of this La Nina compared to other La Nina events such as two thousand and eleven. 2000 into 2012 or the really strong one in late 2010 into, into 2011. So I've got maps there of the typical rainfall and maximum temperatures you would expect through summer from, from the Nina conditions. And you can see the, um, in general, the um, uh, tendency towards wetter conditions across particularly the Eastern States and, and particularly Queensland and tendency towards cooler temperatures um, in La Nina. It's worth looking back to past years that, that saw the very late de development of La Nina's like we've, we've seen this year. And I've got those years listed there. So we got to late 2011, sorry, 2001 into 2000, year 2000 into 2001, 2008 into 2009, and then 2011 into 2012. And I guess it's worth noting that um, in general, there was a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a push towards wetter conditions in, 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 um, in those years. But it is actually pretty patchy, um, and so certainly um, late developing La Niñas certainly don't necessarily mean that it's going to be widespread wet conditions everywhere. Um, that's so that's worth keeping in mind, and and I guess even for South Australia in particular in WA, um, there's actually a little bit of a tendency there towards drier conditions in in those late developing La Niña years. Temperatures uh, once again, it's a bit of a big story in terms of the uh, difference from average of temperatures in those three years, that a bit like what we're seeing at the moment. Um, did tend to be cooler through summer in 2011-12, in 
but um, actually in 2000, 2001 and 2008, to get into 2009, summer temperatures were actually a little bit on the warm side, um, quite warmly so in 2000. Um, so I guess the key thing, key thing out of this, yes, it's La Nina, um, but it is very late. It's a very weak one. It's not going to be around too long. Um, the ocean temperatures around northern Australia are not typical of La Nina. So the impacts, um, don't go away expecting it's going to be really, really cool and really wet through this, through this coming summer, because that's certainly, um, we could, could certainly end up with something a bit different from that. So in terms of forecast information to help through this, through the summer and in, through into harvest, um, I would just uh, point people at our MedEye tool. If people haven't had a look at that, it's well worth going out to have a look at our, it's really uh, one of the ways to access our seven day forecast information that we produce and we update twice a day. Um, it's on a six kilometer grid across Australia. You can go in and get maps of, um, and, and um, a table of forecast conditions for your location. So click anywhere on the map there and get a table of maximum temperatures, the likely, likelihood of rain and likely rainfall range. You can also look at things like um, the thunderstorm likelihood, humidity, um, temp you've got temperatures, winds, and with getting really good feedback about a wind forecast in terms of the, uh, being able to plan out a week ahead when, when, um, when you might be able to get some wind, some, some spraying done. Um, and clicking on the detail buttons there gives you a bit more, gives you the three hour time steps through each day ahead. You can also access our forecast, inf forecast database via our app. So um, Google Play and the Apple iStore have got the app sitting there for free. So just look for the Bureau of Meteorology um, app and download that. Or you can actually look at the forecast information in more detail for your location by using m.bomb.gov.au in a browser on your phone or tablet. And so that looks a bit like this. You can get tables up of conditions going out, out through this, out through a few days ahead, looking at um, in detail about likelihood of super significant weather like thunderstorms or frost, uh, the likelihood of rain occurring at different periods through the day and different temperatures and wind speeds and, and directions. Um, and I guess one thing I will keep in mind, it's not looking like we'll actually need this so much through this summer and through into autumn. Um, but we, we are running our heat wave warning service, which takes, uh, looks at three day blocks of um, the nighttime and daytime temperatures and maps that out across Australia um, using the climate for each, each location. So uh, it, it maps out the likelihood of low intensity, severe or extreme, extreme heat wave activity through the week ahead in three day blocks. Um, and it calculates that according to the local climate for each location. So that's something to, uh, to keep an eye on uh, when we are forecasting um, periods of extreme heat. And uh, in terms of the agriculture program, I, I'll mention one of the things we are doing at the moment is, is, get, is once again getting, more getting much more focused um, in terms of our bringing, bringing our, our weather and climate information to, to growers and producers. Um, and one of the things we're doing at the moment is trialling seven day to medium term briefings to some South Australian wine regions at the moment. And so I'll, I'll just reiterate again that uh, we're really keen to have conversations with you, with people about how can we better match up our, our information to your needs. So in terms of the longer term outlook, um, our seasonal, seasonal season outlook page, I've got the link there. Uh, one of the things that's been really useful is the three to four minute video summary that we update with each release of the, um, of the Outlook. Uh, there is the free email subscription there, so you can go and pop your email in and the latest Outlook will come through to your box when it, when it gets updated. Now, we, up until August this year, we were updating this in the last week of each month. We've actually gone to uh, a mid-month upgrade uh, update as well. So that's something you, uh, you people may, may or may not have picked up on, um, that we are updating more frequently, so giving a little bit more lead time so for instance, our first summer outlook actually came out through mid-November rather than running, running, running to the end of the month for that outlook to come out. So um, what is it saying at the moment? We've got the likelihood of exceeding medium rainfall map on the left there, there for, for, for the whole of summer. And so the green areas on the, the map there are indicating a stronger likelihood of wetter conditions, wetter than, wetter, wetter than the median conditions. Um, the white areas mean it's about as likely to be wetter as it is to be drier. So across South Australia, um, it's, it's a bit of a 50-50 signal. 
Uh, and across parts, across the northern parts of uh, the country, there's some indications of drier conditions. So up in Cape, Cape York, for instance, looking more likely to be on the dry side overall. But it is worth digging down into monthly maps because you can get a little bit more detailed picture. So um, our outlook, which um, uh, came out in late November, for December was indicating wet conditions and that's um, as I'm sure you're all well aware of certainly certainly happened um, in that we've had a wet December um, much of a lot of locations are received, already received two to three times their average December rainfall or even even exceeding their, their whole summer rainfall um, just in that uh, first few days of December um, there's as I, as I indicated in that sort of medium term outlook, um, there's likely to be a little bit more rainfall in the eastern states through the next uh, few weeks, but um, certainly not expecting anything as significant as what we've seen, seen already so far this month. January um, is uh, a little bit more of a 50 50 signal over much of uh, most of the wine regions. Um, I guess there's some parts of coastal New South, well, the eastern parts of New South Wales indicating that perhaps the Hunter um, and some of the more coastal wine regions in New South Wales and Eastern Victoria might pick up a little bit more rainfall in January. Um, but in general, it's a, it's a little bit of a 50-50 signal. So not strong indications of, of wet conditions across, uh, across Australia in January. The temperature outlook um, is, I guess the thing to note with this is it's a little bit of a mixed, mixed, mixed picture uh, not strong indications of cool or strongly indication, strong indications of cooler conditions across uh, across the eastern states. The strong indication of warm conditions in those red areas across southeast of Australia is is really the big highlight. And I think the key thing to keep in mind with that is it's really coming from those warm ocean temperatures that we're seeing uh, around Tasmania and and uh, the coastal areas of Victoria and southeast and South Australia at the moment. So that's where that um, where the where that those indications of warmer conditions are coming from, and they do persist through December and into January, as you'll, you'll notice on the right hand side there. Um, some strong indications of some um, milder temperatures through through December, uh, seen in that uh, map on the top top right. Um, a little bit on the cool, indicating a little bit on the cool side in those slight push towards cooler conditions being more likely in across. Um, uh, across New South Wales and Queensland through January. Um, and I guess one of the things that's very like, looking very likely to be warmer than average across Tasmania and, and uh, Victoria and South Australia, digging in a little more, um, it's not looking like it's going to be heaps warmer than average. So looking at uh, the temperature anomalies, it's actually looking, yep, yeah, it's very likely to be warmer than average, but not really strongly warmer than average. I guess it's the key message to take away. So this doesn't mean lots and lots of heat waves, um, not seeing indications of really, really extreme heat wave activity. It's really likely to be, be warmer than average, but not, 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 that doesn't mean heaps of heat wave activity uh, from this outlook. Um, what can we say longer term? Um, so I've got some, deep, some maps there of rainfall on the left and the difference from average maximum temperatures on the right. And it just continues much the same sort of picture. Um, there's some indications of, of wetter conditions across the western half of the country in February in those green areas. Um, so some of that, some of that moisture from the, off, some of those warmer than average temperatures in the northern, off to northwest of Australia, feeding some moisture across the country at some point in February. Um, whether or not that's tied up with, a, with another burst of the MJO, um, it, it's a bit hard to say this far ahead, but it's certainly something to keep an eye on in terms of um, whether we see an MJO event develop sometime in February. March, um, it's pretty 50-50 pretty signal. Um, it's, uh, it's not seeing strong indications of wet or dry conditions in March at this stage on that map on the, the bottom left. Um, and just in general, in terms of temperatures, it's just a slight push towards cooler conditions, um, a little more so through February, um, but close to average in terms of temperatures through March. So once again, it's, it's not looking, not, not seeing any strong indications for extreme heat or anything through, uh, through, the, through late February into, uh, into autumn. And looking at autumn overall, um, so this is um, stretching the stretching the skill of the forecasting system a little bit, but 
just in terms of what we can say, um, there's just a tendency towards drier conditions on the left-hand side across much of Australia. Um, and just hitting a little bit on the warm side overall for autumn uh, in terms of those temperature anomalies on the right-hand side, but not, not looking super extreme. So that's about as much as we can say at the moment. So um, just to sum up some of that before we get into some questions. Um, so it has been a dry and warmer winter and spring for, for many regions. Um, the lineup, so we've had that, that burst of very wet conditions in early December. There were a lot, lot of ducks lined up for that, um, that early December rainfall event to come off. So we had, um, um, we had that uh, burst of M Madden Julian isolation activity. We also had the, uh, what's called, a positive, we had a positive phase of the southern annular mode. So for those who are familiar with SAM, that essentially means the cold fronts contracted further south and that allowed the tropics to have a bit more influence through early December as well. That's not looking, we're not seeing anything lining up like that um, uh, through, the, through the next sort of four, four possibly six weeks. So um, it's, it's not, not something that we're super concerned about at the moment until probably late January, perhaps, perhaps into February. December's looking milder for temperatures for many regions, um, particularly over the uh, eastern states. Um, the year has been declared, but it's certainly not a typical linear event in lots of ways. It's quite late. Uh, it's not going to be around for very long, and the ocean temperatures around northern Australia are, are looking to stay uh, quite a bit cooler than average than you might expect for a typical La Nina, so having less impact um, and contributing less to rainfall. Um, just saying that, there are some, some weak indications of increased chance of wetter conditions in the eastern regions. Um, and I guess that heat in the southeast is is well worth well worth noting for those areas and uh, wine regions that in those areas. That is likely to continue um, to be just a little bit on the warm side because of those warm ocean temperatures for those coastal areas in in Victoria and in South Australia. And I will just reiterate um, with the, with the bureau's agricultural program, uh, we're really keen to, to to talk more about how we can can better better match up our products. So. I've just been through a lot of our stuff on our website, and a lot of that is fairly general in lots of ways. And so we'd love to have some conversations about how we can make this stuff a bit more tailored for people so they can get more, more intelligence and a bit more uh, information out of, out, of, out of our products. So I think we're about to hand over for some questions. Um, and while we are waiting for the questions to come in, I'll just let you know that we um, our next webinar is going to be on the 19th of January and um, Dr Chris Steele from CSU will discuss break bunch rocks and the thresholds for wine contamination. Now Colin has sent in a question and he said why 1981 to 2010 climatology data and not later data included? And hang on, I've just got to unmute you. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Um, so you've noted on some of those maps that the uh, the averages there are calculated according to. So when when I say um, the point of our our, um, our forecast, our outlook information is indicating that, uh, for instance, temperatures in the southeast are likely to be you know one degree warmer than average. Um, what's the average that they've used for that? Uh, we've used the period 1981 to 2010. Um, so um, we look, we're looking at 30 year periods and we tend to obviously center on the decades. And so then 81 to 2010 climatology period is, is just, um, just a common, common climatological period that we're using uh, in terms of what is the average um, for, uh, to, to compare our, our outlook information to. Um, and so when we, when we get to the end, when we get to 2020, we may well update the to 90, 1991 to 2020, start using that as the average. Um, but at the moment, we're still still in that period. So we'll stick to the 90, 1981 to 2010. Thank you, Darren. We'll leave it, wait a little bit longer and see if some more questions come in. Um,
Well, we don't seem to be getting any questions at the moment, so I think we might wrap up the session. So, yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, and oh, if you do want to follow up, um, yeah, thanks, everyone. And if you do want to follow up, uh, my email's there. Uh, feel free to get in touch. Um, yeah, so, yeah, thanks again. And uh, just, just really keep, it, keep an eye out on our season outlook and um, going to have a look at our, our forecasting tools to help through the, uh, through the next few months and, and through harvest. Thank you. Okay, before wrapping up, I'd like to first extend a thank you to Darren for providing the content for this informative session. Oh, we've just had another question that we'll just answer. So, just wondering how soil moisture data and soil profile data is compiled. Uh, so, great question. Um, so basically, I might just go all the way back to that slide. Um, so what we're doing is um, is taking um, taking our rainfall rainfall analysis, so rainfall gridded data data sets on a five kilometer resolution, solar radiation. Um, there's wind speed grid. There's vegetation uh, soil type grids, and running just running calculations. Um, on a on a daily basis, on that on that five kilometre grid across Australia, of the amount of uh, so basically the water balance calculation. So we've got um, uh, what's calculated to run off, how much how much rainfall is coming in, um, how much gets evaporated out, um, according to the soil, soil types and vegetation that's there, um, and how much percolates through through each through each each from the surface down into each layer. Um, and then down into the deep drainage at the bottom as well. Um, so, you know, it, it is um, so it is is modelled. So it's a calculated or modelled soil moisture. It is it is validated against um, against available observed information such as uh, runoff data and soil moisture actual soil moisture observed data. Um, so you know we certainly certainly calibrated that with with what information we've got available. Um, and it is five kilometer resolution. There is work going on at the moment to improve that resolution down to, I think about the two kilometer scale. So, um, and yeah, so it is, it is three layers. So you can see on the diagram on the right there. Um, and there are other, I guess, caveats in that the wind speeds that we're using, which influence the air transpiration, uh, um, we're using basically a climatological wind grid at the moment. We're trying to incorporate some um, some actual wind speed um, wind speed data in there in a in, in our in a newer version. So utilising some um, some high resolution wind speed um, wind speed reanalysis data to improve the uh, the evapotranspiration calculations. So it's not perfect, um, but it is. Um, is useful. It goes back quite a few years, and there is uh, we've done we've rerun it back to using all available data back to 1911. So if people do want that complete data set, um, as, as it says on their website, they can can get in touch with us and um, get hold of that complete data set back to back to 1911. Thank you, Darren. Um, I'd like to, say, to thank Darren again, and uh, we will be closing the session in a minute. Um, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for participating in today's session, and I'd like to remind you that you'll be receiving a follow-up email with a link to the recording on YouTube this afternoon. Um, that's the last AWRI webinar for the year, but anyone who's planning for next year, there is a session scheduled for the 19th of January when Dr. Chris Steele from CSU will discuss grape bunch rots and thresholds with for wine contamination. Um, if you'd like to register this, for this session, please visit the AWRI website. 
And on behalf of the AWRI, I'd like to wish everyone a safe and happy Christmas, and I look forward to hearing from you again in 2018.